So I have the wonderful opportunity of introducing Greg Graber, who is our Director of Social and Emotional Learning here at Lausanne Collegiate School, and he is going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Greg? Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I wanted to thank everyone uh, for making this SEL speaker series such a hit for our first year of doing it. We really appreciate the great feedback that you've given us, and I'm really excited uh, that our big finale is is Dr. Colby Taylor. I wasn't going to say this because it makes me seem really old, but I don't, I don't want to give Colby the satisfaction of saying it, so I'm going to follow my own sword. I taught Colby high school honors English many years ago, and uh, it is just so delightful to see one of your former students do so well. Colby is a psychologist. He is a professor at Christian Brothers University here in Memphis. Um, also kind of the neat thing, well, there are a lot of neat things about Colby, but um, he was on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek. And I'm gonna ask him about that in a second. I've got a question for you, Colby, on that. And he also was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I think he did really well on Jeopardy. I'm not so sure about who wants to be a millionaire. So Colby, before I turn it over to you, um, who do you want to be the next host of Jeopardy and why? And please don't make it anyone other than LeVar Burton. So. Yeah, no, it's it's got to be LeVar Burton uh, for sure. And he hasn't even he hasn't even done his test run yet, and I'm already sold on him. So 100% Team LeVar. Thank you for being here. We're excited. I'm going to turn, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks. I want to say Mr. Graber, uh, but thanks, Greg, Mr. Graber. Um, it wasn't that long ago that, that you were my high school English teacher, um, but it's a, it's a privilege to be talking with you tonight. And uh, Amy and Greg probably don't know this, but um, I was a little worried that tonight's talk might not happen, um, at least in its traditional format. Uh, my wife, Lauren, is nine months pregnant, and uh, the due date's technically May 17th, um, but I thought there was a possibility that the baby might come either right before or during this talk. Um, so just as a contingency plan, I actually like, recorded uh, a test run last night, and uh, I was going to send you a last-minute email if she went into labor or anything. Um, but as of right now, no baby. Um, so I'm able to talk to you live, but if you see me make like a really quick or sudden movement out of the corner of my eye, uh, or disappear, um, it probably means something's happening or something happened. So, um, but anyways, as, as Greg was saying, or as Amy was saying, this is a really safe space. Feel free to ask questions, to interrupt me. I'm a really informal speaker, so I'm not gonna get uh, upset or anything if, uh, if you interrupt. Um, but the subject of my talk tonight is the brain, body, and movement. And sort of the way I see this talk going is I wanna make a link or a, a case for the link between physical activity and mental health. Um, and along the way, I'll tie in my training and my clinical experiences, um, and then introduce a therapeutic term, which is called behavioral activation. And then towards the end of this talk, um, I'll try to tie in how I'm trying to walk the walk, um, literally through my work with college students on the autism spectrum at Christian Mothers University, um, uh, with the STARS program at CBU. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share screen right now. I have sort of a, a, a slideshow. Um, one second. Uh, can, you, can you see the PowerPoint? Thumbs up. I guess you're over on the side if you can see it. Awesome. All right. So um, as Greg was saying, I'm a psychologist, but you know, I'm a psychologist that works with kids. And my interest in exercise and mental health really started during my internship year on the island of Kauai. And it started with sort of a confluence of things. Um, first off, when I met my supervisor, my clinical supervisor, uh, Dr. Brad Klontz um, on the island, I noticed in his office, uh, he had a pair of dumbbells under his desk and he had a pull-up bar over the doorway. And he was always one to sort of pump out a few reps in between clients. And he said that cleared his mind. And it sort of stuck with me, um, as you might be able to see with my own exercise equipment in the background in my home office slash gym. Um, but we get out of the office occasionally and we, we, we talk about cases over a game of tennis. Um, Dr. Klotz is a, a best-selling author and is one of the leading figures in the field of financial psychology. 
And so I highly encourage you to check him out if you get a chance. Uh, but anyways, I emphasize getting outdoors and, and doing stuff during my year on Kauai. Um, and I promise there'll be no more shirtless pictures of me throughout the talk. This is it. Uh, but during the year in Kauai, I, I lost almost 20 pounds and I got in really, really good shape. Um, I went on hikes every chance I could get. Uh, I snorkeled after work. I, I bought a stand-up paddleboard. This is awesome getting out and doing things. Um, and I started out working out with a group of people. You see this picture on the left here um, called All Right Fitness. Uh, my coworker, who's uh, in here, Paige Javier, uh, put me in touch with All Right. And the sense of community was awesome. Um, everyone was super encouraging. Um, it, was a, it was a sense of community I haven't really experienced before. And with all of this hiking, with all of this swimming, with all this exercise, I started feeling really good. I started feeling happier. Um, and it's probably not a coincidence that the leader of All Right goes by the name Coach Smiley. Um, we ended up training for a Spartan race together, and it was, it was just a great experience. Um, but while I started feeling better, I was working with kids who weren't feeling so great. Uh, who had really high levels of anxiety and depression. And one of the things a lot of people don't realize about Kauai County is it has one of the highest rates of adolescent suicide in the country. And while working with these kids, I noticed a pattern. Uh, many of the kids that I was working with weren't getting outside. They weren't physically active. Um, now, whether they weren't physically active because they were depressed or whether they were depressed because they weren't physically active is sort of debatable. Um, but I'm going to argue in this talk that the causality doesn't really matter. Um, but anyways, it was sort of shocking to me that a lot of these kids weren't getting outside. A lot of these depressed kids weren't getting outside. Um, the weather in Kauai is like 75 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees year round. And there's waterfalls and coral reefs and mountain trails. And it's just, it's an outdoor paradise. Um, so I was in disbelief. Um, I also didn't realize that many Hawaiian youth don't know how to swim. Um, they offered swimming lessons at the high schools there. Uh, so just a lot of things that I really took for granted. And the island of Kauai is surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. And it also has freshwater. Um, actually, the Wailua River there is the only navigable river in the entire state of Hawaii. So I started doing some research and reading on water and mental health. And I would go to the beach each evening and I would read this book, uh, Blue Mind, after work. Um, so water is healing. Uh, water's calming. Um, there's a reason why many of your desktop backgrounds on your computer probably involve water or a beach scene. Uh, there's a reason why we vacation at the beach and we feel relaxed when we're at Destin or Gulf Shores or somewhere. Um, there's a reason why when you go to sleep, you might turn on a sound machine and sound machines use the sound of waves crashing or the sound of rain on a roof, right? I think it's actually just started raining here uh, where I'm at to lull us to sleep. Um, and there's a reason why waterfront property is so expensive. Uh, having a view of water um, can actually add years onto your life. Um, so water is great for mental health and exercising around or in water is even better. Uh, anyways, all of these things from Kauai sort of stuck with me. And when I moved, moved back to Memphis, uh, I noticed that um, in my work at Shelby County Schools and then at my work at University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center, and then now at my work at Christian Brothers University, um, the link I saw in Hawaii between mental health and physical health held here in the Mid-South. So Memphis is a really stressed out city. Uh, and it's becoming even more stressed with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's no surprise that the pandemic's adversely affecting the mental health of children across the world, right? We're seeing increases in mental health difficulties in China and Italy and Spain, uh, all across the United States. I've read dozens of studies. And most studies are showing anywhere between a 25 to 75% increase in mental health related concerns among school aged children. And there are increased feelings of isolation, increased feelings of loneliness. And these are sadly leading more youths to engage in suicidal behaviors. Uh, so back in November, 2020, Lieb and colleagues published a study on mental health related emergency room visits in kids, uh, in kids younger than age 18. And the study compared emergency department visits from April, 2020 to October, 2020, um, against visits from that same time frame in 2019 when the pandemic wasn't going on. 
And actually they were comparing the proportion of ED visits. And I hate that acronym ED for uh, emergency department just because of the initialisms, other usage. Um, so they weren't looking at raw numbers of ED visits because thankfully raw numbers of ED visits were down uh, during that time, or at least during the beginning of 2020 because of shelter in place orders. Um, but of the ED visits that did occur, there was a pretty big increase in the proportion of those visits that were related to mental health concerns. And this proportion started uh, to increase in uh, March 2020, and actually mid-March 2020, uh, when the pandemic began. Uh, among kids ages 5 to 11, there was a 24% increase in the proportion of mental health emergencies. And among kids ages 12 to 17 years old, there was a 31% in the proportion of mental health emergencies. And this used CDC data um, from their um, emergency surveillance program. So it had pretty large scale uh, samples. Um, I don't know if anybody listens to NPR, uh, but NPR had a story a few weeks ago that talked about increased suicidal behaviors in youth during the pandemic. And some of the info shared in this NPR story was, was really troubling. Um, Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis saw a 250% increase uh, in suicide attempts since the pandemic began. Uh, and uh, they weren't the only ones. Um, there was a 200% increase uh, in Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, California, too. Um, in adults, using CDC data, um, rates of anxiety and depression have tripled, actually more than tripled, since the pandemic began. Uh, before the pandemic, about 6.6% .6 of adults uh, reported significant symptoms of depression. Um, and as of August 2020, um, we're at about 25%. So the numbers, again, fourfold increase. Um, and no other state reported higher rates of depression than Tennessee. 28.3% of adults, so almost a third of Tennesseans, are reporting significant symptoms of depression. And that was true throughout most of 2020. Um, and a study, uh, a large-scale study by Retail Me Not, um, indicated that Memphis is the city with the poorest mental health in the United States. So if you live in Memphis, we live in the most stressed out city in the most stressed out state in the entire country. Um, so we're the home of the blues in more ways than one. Um, we also live in one of the most unhealthy sedentary cities in the United States. Uh, Tennessee consistently ranks in the top five or bottom five, however you wanna look at it, for rates of childhood obesity. Um, the, the latest numbers put us at about one in 20 children in the state having uh, childhood obesity. Um, but things are even worse in the city of Memphis. Uh, about one in three kids have childhood obesity. And the number is increasing. And we think it's increasing rapidly, but we don't have really good numbers on it with the pandemic. Um, it's really, really troubling. We also have one of the worst diabetes rates in the country. Um, so not only do we live in, one, live in one of the most stressed out states and one of the most stressed out cities in the entire country, we also live in one of the unhealthiest states and one of the unhealthiest cities in the entire country. Um, so I always hate when, you know, lists of like physical and mental health stuff is published by the CDC or by other organizations, because I immediately either scroll to the top or scroll to the bottom to find out where Memphis is, because uh, it's more efficient than going through the middle. It always seems like we're, we're top or bottom five of something. Uh, but anyways, the, 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 the premise of the talk tonight is that I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, so I, I've tried to insert some quotes on the importance of exercise and movement throughout the presentation. Um, here's one by Albert Einstein. Uh, and by the way, uh, while you read this, Einstein might have actually discovered the theory of relativity while he was riding his bike. Um, so pretty cool, smart person. I think we'd all agree. Right. Any, any, any questions? I, nobody, I think, has interrupted me so far. I haven't been able to monitor the chat too much. Uh, but again, if you have, have a question, pipe off about any of the studies or anything that, uh, uh, that I'm citing. Uh, anyway, but you're probably, at this point, a little bit tired of, of, hearing, of hearing from me, at least, hearing my voice. Um, so I'm going to show with, uh, show, share with you or show you a video uh, by Andrew Solomon. Um, and I'm going to argue that the video demonstrates that psychology, or at least the traditional way in which we go about therapy, is, is broken. Um, it's about 15 minutes long. Um, if you don't know Andrew Solomon, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, I require my students um, to read The Noonday Demon. I've got it here behind me. 
it's an awesome book. I think my students, when they pick this up, they hate me because it's like 800 pages long. Um, but it's awesome. I, I tell them they'll thank me later. Uh, this is about depression um, and Far From the Tree, which is about human development. Uh, but anyways, I can pull up the, uh, the Solomon video. Let's see. Can you can you see the YouTube video? Or are you still seeing the the PowerPoint? Uh, still seeing the PowerPoint, Colby. Okay, I will end the presentation or whatever. And one second, let me do a new share. Now, can you see it? Sweet. Yeah. All right. I'm going to play it. I guess I'll turn the volume up because I guess you'll be hearing it through my, my audio feed. And uh, I might turn off my camera while this is playing. I'm even less depressed now. <laughs> I was depressed for a long time. And I wrote about being depressed. And I lived for a long time with blinding depression and had long stretches when everything seemed hopeless and pointless, when returning calls from friends seemed like more than I could do, when getting up and going out into the world seemed painful, when I was completely crippled with anxiety. And when I finally got better and started writing about the process of recovery, I became very interested in all of the different kinds of treatment that there were for depression. And having started as a kind of medical conservative, thinking that there were only a couple of things that worked, medication and certain talking therapies, and that that was really it, I very gradually began to change my mind. Because I realized that if you have brain cancer and you decide that standing on your head and gargling for half an hour every day makes you feel better, it may make you feel better, but the likelihood is that you still have brain cancer and you're still going to die from it. But if you have depression and you say that standing on your head and gargling for half an hour makes you feel better, then you are actually cured because <laughs> depression is an illness of how you feel. And if you feel really great after you do that, then you're not depressed anymore. So I began to think all kinds of things could work. And I researched everything ranging from experimental brain surgeries to hypnotic uh, regimens of various kinds. I had people writing to me because I had been publishing on this subject. There's one woman who wrote to me and she said that she had tried actually electroshock treatments and a variety of other approaches to depression, medication and therapy. And she had finally found the thing that worked for her and she wanted me to tell the world about it. And that was, making little things from yarn, um, some of which he sent me, and none of which I'm wearing right now. But in any event, um, I had that, um, that rich engagement. And I also became interested, as I was doing this work, in the idea that depression existed not only in the civilized West, as people tended to perceive it to exist, but actually across cultures and had existed across time. And so when one of my dearest friends, my friend David Hecht, who was living for a little while in Senegal said to me, do you know about the tribal rituals that are used for the treatment of depression here? I said, no, I don't know about them, but I would like to know about them. And he said, well, if you come for a visit, we could try to do some research on this topic. And so I set off for Senegal and I met David and I was introduced to David's then girlfriend, now ex-wife, Ellen. <laughs> and um, uh, it turned out that Ellen had a cousin whose mother was a friend of someone who went to school with the daughter of a person who actually practiced the undok, and that I could therefore go and interview this woman who had practiced the undok. And so we went off to um, a small town about two hours outside of Dakar. And uh, I was introduced to this extraordinary old, large woman wrapped in miles and miles of African fabric printed with figures of eyes. And she was Madame Diop. And we did an interview for about an hour and she told me all about the Undoc. And at the end of it, feeling rather daring, I said, um, listen, I said, I, I hope 
I, I don't know whether this is something you would even consider. I said, but would it be possible for me to attend an adult? And she said, well, I certainly never had a foreigner. The local word was too bomb. I never had a foreigner attend one of these before. She said, but actually, she said, I mean, you've come through these friends and these connections. She said, yes, the next time I perform an adult, you may be present. And I said, that's fantastic. I said, when are you next going to be doing an adult? And she said, oh, it'll be sometime in the next six months. And I said, six months is quite a long time for me to stay here in this town waiting for you to do one. I said, is there anyone who might, maybe we could expedite one for somebody, move it forward, um, I'll pitch in. Um, she said, no, it really doesn't work that way. She said, I'm sorry, but um, uh, that, that's, that's how it is. And I said, well, I guess I won't be able to see an adult then, but even so, this conversation has been so interesting and so helpful to me. And, and I, I'm a little sad leaving here about not actually getting to see one, but, but I thank you. And she said, well, I'm, I'm glad that you could come. I'm glad it was helpful. And she said, um, but there is one other thing. She said, I, I, I hope you don't mind my saying this. And I said, well, no, what, what is it? And she said, you don't look that great yourself. She said, are you, you are suffering from depression? And I said, well, yes. I said, I, I was very acute. It's kind of a little better now, but I still do actually suffer from depression. She said, well, I've certainly never done this for a two bulb before, but I could actually do an undup for you. And I said, oh, I said, what an, what an interesting idea. I said, well, um, yes, uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, let's, let's, let's do that. I said, then I'll have an undop. And she said, oh, well, that's great, she said. And she gave us some, um, uh, some sort of fairly basic instructions. And then we left. And my translator, the aforementioned then girlfriend, now ex-wife of my friend, turned to me and she said, are you completely crazy? Do you have any idea what you're getting yourself into? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm all these things, very interesting. She said, you're crazy. She said, you're totally crazy, but I'll help you if you want. So we had left, and the first thing we had was a shopping list. There had been a, she had, you could get them to buy the stuff, but you had to pay a surcharge. I said, no, we'd buy the stuff. So we had to go out. We had to buy seven yards of African fabric. Um, we had to get um, a calabash, which was a large bowl fashioned from a gourd. We had to get um, three kilos of millet. We had to get sugar. We had to get cola beans. And then we had to get two live cockerels, two roosters, and a ram. Um, and so Ellen and I went to the market with David and with these other um, people. And we got most of the things. And I said, well, but what, what about the, the ram? And Ellen said, we can't buy the ram today. What are we going to do with it overnight? So I saw the sense of that. So the next day, <laughs> the next day we got into a taxi to go back out two hours to where we were going. And I said, what about the ram? And Ellen said, oh, we'll see a ram along the way. So <laughs> we were going along and going along. And there was a Senegalese shepherd by the side of the road with his flock and we stopped the cab and we got out and we bought the ram for seven dollars and then we had a little bit of a struggle getting the live ram into the trunk of the taxi cab um so but the cab driver seemed not at all worried even by the fact that the ram kept relieving himself in the trunk of the taxi cab um and so then we got to um at roof east and we got there and so well, here i am i'm ready um for my close-up and uh the thing about the induct is that it varies enormously depending on a whole variety of signals and symbols that come from above. So we had to go through this whole shamanistic process and I still didn't know really very much of what was gonna happen. So first I had to change out of my jeans and my t-shirt and put on a loincloth. And then I sat down and then I had my chest and my arms rubbed with millet. And then, uh, which is a brain, and then someone said, oh, we really should have music um, for this. And I said, oh, great. And I thought, you know, I mean, I thought some atmospheric thing. And she came out with her very prized possession, which was a battery operated tape player for which she had one tape, which was Chariots of Fire. So 
We started listening to Chariots of Fire. And in the meanwhile, I was given sort of various shamanistic objects. I had to hold them with my hands and drop them. I had to hold them with my feet and drop them. I, they would sort of say, oh, this augurs well, this augurs badly. There were five assistants to Madame Dior who had all gathered around. And we sort of spent the morning like this and it was all really um, just fine. And then um, they said it was maybe, we started at about eight, maybe about 11, 11.30. They said, well, now it's actually time for the, the central part of the ritual. And I said, oh, okay. And the sound of drumming, forget the drumming I'd been hoping for, the drumming began. And so there was all of this drumming and it was very exciting. And we um, went to the central square of the village where there was a small makeshift wedding bed that I had to get into with the ram. Um, and I have been told it would be very, very bad luck if the ram escaped and that I had to hold on to him. And that the reason we had to be in this wedding bed was that all my depression and all my problems were caused by the fact that I had spirits. In Senegal, you have spirits sort of all over you the way here you sort of have microbes, some are good for you, some are bad for you, some are neutral. Anyway, my bad spirits were extremely jealous of my real life sexual partners, um, some of whom are here tonight. And, um, uh, and then we had to um, mollify the anger of the, um, of the spirit. So I had to get into this wedding bed with the ram and I had to hold the ram very tightly because he, he was not having a good life, this ram. Um, and he of course immediately relieved himself on my leg. And the entire village had taken the day off from their work in the fields and were dancing around us in concentric circles. And as they danced, throwing blankets and sheets of cloth over us. And so we were gradually being buried and it was unbelievably hot and it was completely stifling. And there was the sound of these stamping feet as everyone danced around us. And then these drums, which were getting louder and louder and more ecstatic and more ecstatic. And I was just about at the point in which I thought I was going to faint or pass out, um, not to tread on anyone else's story here, but, um, and at that key moment, um, suddenly all of the cloths were pulled off. I was yanked to my feet. The loincloth that was all I was wearing was pulled from me. The poor old ram's throat was slit, um, as were the throats of the two cockerels. And I was covered in the blood of the freshly slaughtered ram and the cockerels. Um, and so there I was, naked, totally covered in blood. And they said, OK, that's the end of this part of it. And um, <laughs> So, well, okay. And they said, um, but uh, you, uh, uh, they said, we're actually, we, there's a, the next piece comes now. And I said, okay, and we went over back to the area where we've done the morning preparations. And one of them said, but look, it's, it's kind of lunchtime. Why don't we just take a break for a minute? Would you like a Coke? I, I don't drink Coke that much, but at that moment, it seemed like a really, really, really good idea. And I said, yes. And so I sat there naked and completely covered in animal blood um, with flies kind of gathering as they will when you're naked and covered in animal blood. And I, I drank this Coke. And then when I had finished the Coke, they said, okay, now we have the sort of final parts of the ritual. And they said, um, so first you have to put your, your hands by your sides and, and hold your stand very straight and very erect. And I said, oh, okay. And then they tied me up with the intestines of the ram. Um, and in the meanwhile, it was hanging from a nearby tree and they were, there was someone sort of doing some butchering of it and they took various little bits of it out. And then I had to kind of shuffle over all tied up in, in intestines, which most of you probably haven't done, but it's hard. Um, I had to shuffle over and I had to take these little pieces of the ram and I had to dig holes and I had to put the pieces of the ram in the holes. And I had to say something. And what I had to say was actually, to me, incredibly, strangely touching in the middle of this weird experience. I had to say, spirits, leave me alone to complete the business of my life and know that I will never forget you. And I thought, what a kind thing to say to the evil spirits you're exercising that I'll never forget you and I haven't. So anyway. There were various other little bits and pieces that followed. I was given a piece of paper in which all of the millet from the morning had been gathered. I was told that the next morning I, I should sleep with it under my pillow and in the morning get up and give it to a beggar who had good hearing and no deformities. And then when I gave it to him, that would be the end of my troubles. And then 
I put my, the women sort of all filled their mouths with water and began spitting water all over me, which it turns out is the sort of, you know, it's the surround shower effect and rinsing the blood away from me. And it gradually came off. And when I was clean, they gave me back my jeans and everyone danced and they barbecued the ram. And we had this dinner and I felt so up. I felt so up. It had, it had been quite an astonishing experience, even though I didn't believe in the animus principles behind it. All of these people had been gathered together cheering for me, and it was very exhilarating. And I had a very odd experience five years later when I was working on my current book, and I was in Rwanda doing something else altogether. And I got into a conversation with someone there, and I described the experience I had in Senegal. And he said, oh, you know, we have something that's a little like that. He said, that's West Africa. This is East Africa. It's quite different. But there are some similarities um, in some rituals here. He said, you know, we had a lot of trouble with Western mental health workers who came here immediately after the genocide. And we had to ask some of them to leave. And I said, what, what was the problem? And he said, OK. He said, they came and their practice did not involve being outside in the sun, like what you're describing, which is, after all, where you begin to feel better. There was no music or drumming to get your blood flowing again when you're depressed and you're low and you need to have your blood flowing. He said there was no sense that everyone had taken the day off so that the entire community could come together to try to lift you up and bring you back to joy. He said there was no acknowledgement of the depression as something invasive and external that could actually be cast out of you again. He said instead they would take people one at a time into these dingy little rooms and have them sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things that had happened to them. <laughs> he said, we had to get them to leave the country. Thank you. All right. Get resituated here and go back to sharing. Um, my PowerPoint. So that's Andrew Sullivan. Um, if you like the video, if you like his sense of humor, um, I bet you'll love his books. Uh, but I'm going to use that video. You probably were wondering what was going uh, like five or 10 minutes in. Um, but I'm going to use that video to argue that our Western mental health system is, is broken. And this is one of the reasons that I prefer to do assessment over therapy. Um, I am pretty good at telling people what I think might be wrong, but I'm not so good at helping to fix it. Um, when I was doing therapy, I would sort of get frustrated with therapy clients. Um, I felt like I was spinning my tires sometimes. And research, a lot of research um, sort of sh supports the notion that, that therapy isn't that effective. Um, Broadly speaking, uh, mental health practitioners are thrilled. They're thrilled if half of their clients get better. Um, antidepressants tend to only help about 50% of people at best. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, I'm trained in CBT. That's uh, sort of my bread and butter. It has the most robust effectiveness research behind it of any talk therapy. Um, it also leads to only about 50% of people at best experiencing improvement. Um, I'd say that if you go to a psychologist or counselor in Memphis area, there's probably a greater than 90% chance they're practicing CBT. Uh, and the effectiveness of psychopharmaceuticals in talk therapy hasn't really gotten that much better in the past 30 years. Hasn't gone up in the past few decades. Uh, we haven't seen these increases in effectiveness. Uh, we've actually maybe seen a little bit of a decline in the effectiveness since the, the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, in fact, you might have noticed if you watch TV, uh, I don't know if anybody watches TV anymore, but uh, there's less and less television commercials for antidepressants. Um, pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're, they're tired of spinning their tires. Um, they've cut their spending for psychopharmaceutical research by over 70%. Um, anyways, here's another one of those quotes. I promise to uh, intersperse in the talk. Um, I really like this one. Also riding a bicycle in the picture, this might be, might be a theme. I'm 
Right. So anyways, enter behavioral activation. So you might be asking, what is, what is behavioral activation? Um, it can be simply defined as doing stuff, uh, specifically doing good stuff. So planning on getting out and doing pleasurable things, which oftentimes you don't want to do when you're depressed. You don't want to go out and do anything. Uh, you might experience what we call anhedonia. Uh, anhedonia means lack of pleasure. You kind of feel strung out. So in a way, behavioral activation is sort of faking it till you make it. And with behavioral activation, the, the, the therapist is kind of more like a coach than a therapist. Uh, this isn't rocket science. Um, and I think the simplicity of this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm drawn to it. Uh, it actually uh, it comes from some uh, like 1950s behavioral uh, research on depression. Uh, but again, the, the, the therapist is more of a, a coach and an encourager um, than what we think about as a, a, a traditional sort of psychotherapist. Um, it's important to remember with behavioral activation that it's not simply doing more. Um, if feeling better were that easy, you, you probably would have already done it. Um, so you know, as a psychologist, my expertise lies in figuring out what activities would be most helpful and what small and manageable steps you can do to get started. Um, you can think of me as a coach or a consultant to you in the process of change. Um, I'm also not going to say that the that, that behavioral activation or that exercise is a panacea, is a cure-all. Um, Push-ups aren't going to replace Prozac and running isn't going to replace Ritalin. Uh, but I really do think that exercise has an important role in therapy. So what better way to engage in behavioral activation than outside of the traditional therapy room? So going back to Andrew Solomon's talk, right? Therapy doesn't need to be sitting in a tiny, poorly decorated room. I think some of my fellow psychologists have really uh, drab taste, and I think they go to thrift stores to, to decorate their office. Uh, without windows, right, for, for HIPAA or for, for reasons, oftentimes there's not a, not a window in the therapy room. Um, and they talk about bad things. You know, they expect you to talk about bad things that have happened to you for an hour. Um, when, as humans, we're wired to feel better when we're, when we're singing, when we're, we're dancing, when we're exercising, when we have community support. And circling back to Kauai, this was sort of the recipe behind All Right Fitness. This is probably one of the reasons I liked All Right so much. So with this in mind, why not take therapy outside? We could do therapy on a walk. We could do therapy in a park. Uh, with the pandemic, I think we've been confined to, enough to our offices and our home offices and computer rooms or whatever. Um, plus being outdoors is way less conducive to COVID spread. So let's take therapy out of the traditional four walls. Um, Getting outside is especially important for our youth because kids aren't getting outside. Um, I talk with some of my students and they don't leave their dorm rooms for the entire weekend. Uh, they play video games for hours on end. And this has gotten way worse the pan with the pandemic. And I don't think that research has caught up with that. Um, my students, they can't go to, to parties or to the dining hall um, like, they, like, like they normally would before the pandemic. Um, and kids are really losing their sense of community. And this was already sort of happening when I was in school, uh, which wasn't too long ago. I don't want to rub this in with, uh, with Graber. Um, so I'm not too far removed from, from college and from high school. Uh, and from having friends that would stay in their dorm room and play Xbox for, for hours on end. Uh, this is a huge issue. And it's an issue for adults, too. Um, when when COVID-19 closed down the gym, I, I found myself chained to my computer, sitting right here in my home office. Um, you know, and I wanted to be a psychologist or a professor precisely so I wouldn't become a desk jockey. So I wouldn't be chained to a cubicle or a computer. Um, so I took a cue from Mr. Greg Graber and, and I started running. Uh, Graber's a huge runner or maybe now a walker. Uh, but he's doing this virtual run thing across Tennessee. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before the talk. Uh, I'm nowhere in the same league as him. But since the pandemic began, uh, I've run four half marathons and two full marathons. Outside, virtual, it's been great. It's been a great way to get out and do something and sort of feel a sense of accomplishment. Anyway, here, here, here's another one of those quotes I promised to, to intersperse in. Also bicycle theme. Um,
also from a really smart person, way smarter than I am. So if, you, if you haven't realized sort of my, my way of talking is I, I get really smart people like Andrew Solomon or uh, Albert Einstein or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to, to do the talking for me. And I just you know, sort of regurgitate information. Um, but exercise is empirically supported. Uh, it's supported by research to, to treat or at least augment treatments for a variety of conditions. Um, and there's also some compelling uh, neuroscientific uh, evidence that exercise actually changes the brain. Um, it increases vascularity throughout the brain. Uh, it can serve as a protective factor against dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, it can increase the volume of the hiccup, hippocampus. Uh, I said hiccupampus. I guess it's a Freudian slip or parapraxis. Uh, but the, the hippocampus, which is, which is really important to memory, and there's more and more research saying that, that memory and especially autobiographical memory is, uh, is important um, as a protective factor against depression. And there's evidence that exercise um, has pretty large effect sizes, in some cases, larger effect sizes than a lot of the psychopharmaceuticals or talk therapies that are out there uh, for ADHD, uh, for anxiety, for depression, and for autism. Uh, and I just cited a couple of studies here for each condition, but you could probably go in for, for, for each of these disorders uh, and find a, a dozen citations from the last five or so years. Uh, but it's autism, it's that last bullet point uh, where I'm going to attempt to walk the walk as I talked about uh, earlier in the talk. So one of my passions is autism spectrum disorder. Um, and at Christian Brothers University, we have a nonprofit for students on the autism spectrum called STARS. And STARS acronyms to Students Tackling Autism Related Syndromes. Uh, it's an awesome program. Uh, it's founded by Kim Jameson, who has a son on the autism spectrum. And while her son was in school, she noticed that there was a lack of activities for individuals on the spectrum while in college, and also a lack of social opportunities. Uh, there weren't fraternities or sororities for students on the spectrum. So she founded STARS. And the number of youth on the spectrum is increasing. Uh, the official CDC prevalence rate is one in 54 individuals, um, but I've seen prevalence rates that are, that are much higher and more troubling than that. So there's a huge need for, for a program like STARS. And with STARS, students participate in activities with their neurotypical peers, uh, which fosters an important sense of community, uh, that sense of community I talked about earlier that Andrew Solomon talked about. And in fact, most of the members of STARS are peers without diagnoses of autism. So it's a, a super positive group. There are study halls, there are game nights, there are improv and karaoke nights. Uh, STARS works on academic skills, social skills, and executive functioning skills. Um, STARS has a team program, which helps coach students academically. Um, when these students arrive to college, they no longer have an IEP plan like they might have had in uh, grade school or high school. And the team program builds in academic supports and also helps to support executive functioning, uh, which people on the spectrum tend to struggle with, especially the organizational aspect of, of executive functioning. Uh, one of our uh, psychology professors who uh, might actually be part of the talk tonight, uh, Dr. Rod Vogel, who I consider one of my mentors, uh, is heavily involved in the STARS team program. Um, we have the STARS or social program, which has regular social activities. Um, STARS is a registered student organization on campus, just like fraternities and sororities. And we participate and compete in events like homecoming week. Um, we have stewardship with the STARS. Um, so, so often these students are, are used to people giving to them. Uh, they've sort of been given to their entire life. And this gives them a chance to give back to the community. Um, we have STARS Connects, which helps uh, these students find internships, uh, helps them find careers. Uh, sadly, 85% of individuals on the spectrum are unemployed or underemployed. And often individuals on the spectrum might not perform the best during typical job interviews, but they can become some of the most loyal employees. Uh, just talking to some companies, they can be some of the most loyal employees you can have. Um, STARS also works on physical wellness. Um, a lot of individuals on the spectrum are, sed are sedentary. Uh, they don't get outside. Uh, many are in, in poor physical shape. So the In the Out program was founded to schedule activities uh, like playing volleyball, uh, doing yoga, uh, going on walks, going to Shelby Farms to fish or go on a picnic uh, for people on the spectrum and also their peers. Uh, so it helps instill healthy habits. 
And also individuals are paired with a peer. Uh, and this is sort of where I come in. Um, I volunteered as a peer uh, as part of the Inside Out program. Normally, uh, it's another student. Uh, so I work out, uh, I exercise with a STAR student every week. And in this role, it's awesome. We usually do it on a Friday afternoon. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a personal trainer, I'm just a workout buddy, I'm a friend. Uh, at Christian Brothers University, we have this, this aspiration to walk with students. And I, I guess I took this a little too literally. Um, I walk with the student I'm paired with before we go and lift weights. Uh, we, we, we do a lap around campus. We talk about life. Um, and in meeting with him every week, we've developed a friendship. Um, so we're not just building physical health, we're building social and emotional health as well. Uh, so that's sort of all I have. I'm happy to answer questions, have a conversation with you. Um, it's a great program. And as a psychologist, you know, I, I'll be one of the first that says that uh, we sort of need a, a mental health revolution, um, especially Western mental health. Um, so. Thank you so much. I absolutely love um, the idea of movement and have seen firsthand um, the changes in my own children and my students um, due to the pandemic and how exercise and just moving around and being connected and feeling connected can really change your mental attitude. Um, so I will open it up to any questions. If you would like to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute and or pop the question in the chat and I'll be happy to ask it for you. I have a question. Sure. Uh, I'm Elizabeth and I really enjoyed your discussion, the whole thing. It was really just fascinating from the um, Senegal to the stars, to, to everything, to your experience and how you're really inspired by um, being a part of change in, on so many levels uh, for, for um, and uh, just all we talked about has been just incredible. I was wondering about if something like STARS can exist in a college program. Do you think it could could be in a in a like a high school or a middle school or something? Is there is can you imagine any form of that happening in um, because maybe you know like. If some of these things are on the spectrum of thinking about that or depressed, um, or they're both or whatever, um, that goes on for years. And then, of course, when we, but um, you know, if it could start somehow sooner, wouldn't that be? Kind of amazing so that uh you know that's my question can you imagine this something like stars in a high school middle school or a lower school i i, I can um uh, so I, you know, uh, I, I i heard your question just fine um i, I can't imagine it the, the the high school middle school lower school um, I think one of the reasons why we, we started with, with colleges and universities is because a lot of times this is where folks are becoming independent. And, you know, if, if you're in sort of before COVID, you're in a school setting, um, you know, you have the lunchroom experience. You probably have a group of peers that uh, you're with in your classes and you're sort of uh, forced to interact with other people. Um, although a, a lot of folks on the spectrum do fall through the cracks. Um, whereas when, when you go off to college, a lot of these students, don't leave their dorm room. Um, they, they don't have the social interaction. So, but yes, one of the things about STARS um, is we're looking to start a model uh, to first maybe not, not export, but inspire other colleges and universities because right now there's only 2% of colleges and universities that have some sort of semblance of a program related to, uh, to autism. 
like I said, that in, in talking to high school guidance counselors and and uh, in, in working at the university level, the number of folks on the spectrum is increasing. A lot of guidance counselors have no idea these these and parents of kids yeah. on the spectrum have no idea that these programs exist. So yeah. this is something that's not going away. This is something that yeah. uh, you know we we need to we need to get started on, um, and hopefully you know we we can package this up in a way that it can be replicated at other colleges and universities, but also maybe at the high school, it would look different, you know, at the, the middle school and lower school levels. Sure. Um, but absolutely, you know, the, the, the executive skills coaching component, that's going to be something that's important from, uh, you know, a second grader losing their homework and not writing in their organizer or whatever they write in now. And, you know, some of it's gone digital all the way up to, uh, uh, the exercise and movement habits to, um, you know, interviewing for colleges, which I think a lot of times these kids are under uh, unprepared or underprepared yeah. for the college interview process. So absolutely, I, I, I would like to see, uh, my dream um, is in, you know, 30 years from now that, uh, that STARS has really taken on at other colleges and universities and maybe on other levels too. Um, yeah. you know, high school level, I think would be awesome. Yeah, I, I was just going to add in, um, I mean, I don't, I've just been reading a lot about autism spectrum from the point of view of uh, people who are on the spectrum or some of them like to, some people like to think of uh, other terminology like neurodiversity and like the idea that um, it's not as much about, um, I mean, of course there's a huge range and I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not an expert, but, but uh, I have been working with my son who since birth and since his adoption, who is uh, really unique in his way of thinking. Uh, it's very um, perceptive and imag imaginative and incredibly good memory, but only for certain things and then other things not at all. So executive this and that, but what a difference when he learned to ride a bike. And like somehow all these connections that, uh, the, I, I don't know whether it was the arms and legs and the rotations or just the four limbs working or the freedom, the heart rate of, I don't know what it was, but it was huge. The, yeah, the freedom maybe that that he could he could lead the the the, the way um, on the bike. Anyway, it's been great. And before that, I was kind of exposed to certain ideas like, and I don't want to take up too much time because other people want to speak. But um, have you ever heard of something called brain dance or brain gym? Um, the second term, brain gym, I've heard of. I haven't heard of brain brain dance before. Uh, brain gym is, you know, the crossing, the midline, it's exercise, and they do it in a lot of schools, that's the one you've heard of, and I know it's interesting, but also, uh, also really, uh, with this idea of the blood, I'm uh, not the blood, but the, the drum beats, and the people dancing, people moving together, and how that encourages good spirits, and encourages a sense of feeling um, embraced by your community, I love that, uh, that you brought that up and that I have a dance background. So I'm really into that. And someone named Anne Green Gilbert put together a thing called Brain Dance. And hers, you know, thing, she went into schools and when she could get kids up out of their seats and, and we know why they're in their seats. There's lots to do sitting down. So it's not a knock about uh, needing to sit down, but in between to get up and to um, stand on one leg and tip over and touch the floor and reach way up and do all these different things, so, you know, topical and just different things, uh, increase their ability to learn. So they were more learning ready with that movement, with that um, broad spectrum of movements. So that was really a, a cool thing too. And then um, there's my other thought. And I'm gonna, this last one, some schools are doing something like having a group of people and it has to come from within, but like it's a group of pe kids who, if they notice someone's kind of alone on the playground or something, they, they go and play with them. <laughs> so it's like, if there's that one person who, oh, uh, maybe their behavior has made other people kind of go like, oh, I don't, I don't want to be seen with that person or do something with them because 
then people think I'm weird because that person seems weird or their responses to situations are unexpected or just different. And, and they create a kind of thing around them that, that, that sets off people like, I don't want to be like that or near that person. So these other kids, um, they did that in some school and they're just like, we're going to be the ones who are, um, we're on the bench and we're watching to see if someone needs someone to play with and like run around with or climb with or slide with or and that's like a a kind of lower school version of of you know like the way you walk with people and meet with people and share with people and, and stuff like that. So these ideas are are circulating in my mind since since you're um since what you've been talking about. So thank you. <laughs> No, thank you. And, and it's great that the, the walls are already crumbling and, and dissolving. We're starting to think outside of the box that we've sort of been put in uh, uh, with Western mental health. And I love that you mentioned your background in dance. You know, one of the happiness, I'm into happiness hacks. Um, I, you know, there's some happiness podcasts and stuff. And uh, there's empirical evidence behind dancing for like three minutes a day and making you happier. Um, one of the other things that also makes you happier too, sort of paradoxically, is, is thinking about death for, oh. for two or three minutes every day. Um, <sighs> interesting, it has a pretty good effect size on, on your happiness. Uh, but I, I love that you mentioned that um, and that you know, you're, 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 you're thinking outside of the box once these ideas start flowing, you know, thinking about you know, taking mental health outside of the, the office and doing therapy outside, um, I, I think is awesome. I, I also, Love the idea of talking to, uh, to to kids at recess or in the lunchroom that you know might be sitting alone or playing alone, um, you know, to foster that sense of community because I think we're really going to struggle coming out of this pandemic. I think adults too with with finding that sense of community. I think we're going to have a bunch of socially awkward uh, kids and adults um, that have either been out of school or out of the workplace for so long. Um, so I think inspiring that sense of community because we're wired for community we're wired for movement um it's, it's going to be really really important we were already losing that i think with even before the pandemic with with technology with you know smartphones and everything else so thank you well thank you so much dr taylor for your insight um i loved your talk i totally agree with everything you said as far as movement and memory and mental health. Um, I try to do a walk every day. It just clears my head. Um, I try to instill movement into my technology classes that I do in the classroom. Um, and I think it really helps. So if there are any more questions, please feel free to unmute. Um, otherwise, I would like to thank you again for being here. Um, time is so precious and important these days and we value your time and appreciate and love our community. So um, please check out our website for more SEL events, um, educator resources, and don't forget to join us for our big virtual event this summer in July, Teach Tech. Um, it's gonna be four days of amazing learning um, happening and we have some amazing presenters. Um, I know we have some SEL speakers scheduled already for next school year and we're looking for uh, forward to joining even more so stay tuned to our website for those that information um, and it's 801 p.m. Dr. Taylor you're amazing thank you so much for your time um, any last questions before we depart I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, Thanks, I, feel like I feel like we've come full circle from, um, you know, being uh, when Colby did his internship and I was, when he was reminding me that he was going to work out, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like nine months pregnant when he was working out and drinking his smoothies. And I'm like, oh, Colby. And I think I had like a six week old baby at his like first Spartan sprint. Um, so it's really nice to, um, a good reminder of, all of the resources that we have here on Kauai and what can we do to make um, therapy 
fun and and also just getting out because we have so much and the pictures reminded me like oh yeah we have waterfalls and hikes and really beautiful places and then we're asking these kids to sit in front of the computer in telehealth or you know like come into our office so how can we be more creative um so thank you for the reminder and i will be sure to bring it back to um my program as well thanks Paige. i, I miss you all hopefully when this pandemic's over i'll be able to to come back and visit and everything's come full circle. I don't think that uh, I didn't hear any commotion <laughs> in the background. You didn't see me turn around. So I don't think the baby is here, is here yet. Um, but uh, uh, so we, we, we dodged that for, for right now with the talk, but uh, I'll keep you all updated um, as, as soon as the baby gets here.